Musicians, especially rock stars, are well known for their outrageous personalities. While some can turn off their self-absorbed rock and roll personas offstage, others are just plain rotten, whether they're shredding at the Hollywood Bowl or buying groceries. The world of metal isn't exactly known for subtlety or a gentle persuasion, but you may be surprised at how many growling metal frontmen are thoughtful and caring people. Tim Lambesis of As I Lay Dying is not one of those people. A popular Christian rock singer from Carlsbad is now admitting he hired a hitman to kill his wife. In May 2013, Lambisa solicited someone to off his wife of eight years, offering a cool thousand dollars and detailed instructions on how to go about doing it. His wife, Megan, had filed for divorce the previous year, but that's the only nugget of speculation as to why he wanted to have the mother of his three adopted children murdered. The only problem was that the person he was enlisting to carry out this grim act was actually an undercover police officer. He later pleaded guilty and was sentenced to six years but ended up serving just under three, gaining release in December 2016. As for his band, well, he's back fronting the group who supported him during his trial and jailing. Compassionate friends? You decide. Fans of rock music perennially hold Eric Clapton in the highest esteem when it comes to listing off the greatest guitarists in history. It's fair to include him in those arguments, as he's written some of the most timeless songs and is known for some of the most classic riffs and solos ever. It's when he talks out loud that things sometimes take a turn. Clapton has usually been the first to admit that he's greatly indebted to the black blues musicians who came before him. But if they had been privy to his outburst at a 1976 concert in Birmingham, England, they might not have been so keen to let him fly their flag. During his outburst, a drug and booze-addled Clapton shouted to his concert crowd to quote, keep Britain white. He also announced his support of Enoch Powell. If you don't know who that is, look him up yourself and see how that fly today. If you didn't look it up, let's just spit it out for you. He made it very clear that he did not want people of color in what he thought should be a white country. The years since have seen Clapton very apologetic, blaming his addiction for his behavior. But even in remorse, he can't quite avoid putting his foot in his mouth, saying things like, quote, half of my friends were black, and quote, I dated a black woman. Oof, not a good look, dude. Not a good look. Sebastian Bach, the frontman of 80s and 90s hair metal veteran Skid Row, holds a special place in the hearts of music fans, despite having a dicey history offstage. Bach wore a t-shirt in 1989 that mocked the AIDS crisis. And you know on the raid logo it says kills Bog's dad underneath it. Well this says AIDS kills dead. And that same year chucked a bottle from the stage that ended up breaking a woman's nose. He didn't exactly have the most peaceful 1989. In 2010, Bach was visiting a bar with live music in his Ontario hometown. Bach asked the singer if he and his buddies could come up and sing a little bit, and the musician directed him to the pub's manager. This didn't go over well with Bach. Not sure why a local entertainer wouldn't want the singer of a world-famous rock band to join him, Bach and his group began to loudly heckle the artist, even throwing ice cubes at him from their seats. The staff at the pub understandably grew more nervous and eventually asked Bach's party to leave. The Skid Row singer wanted to take his wine with him, and when that request was denied, Bach smashed the glass, prompting the owner to call the cops. Unsurprisingly, Sebastian also took offense to that. The owner put him in a bear hug, and Bach bit him. After he cooled down, Bach had the usual Canadian sense of humor about the whole incident, saying, quote, America gets rock stars a little more than Canada does. The frontman of the traveling foursome of hedonism that is Motley Crue is someone you would probably expect to be a little wild. But Vince Neil takes that stage character and ramps it up even higher when he's in the real world. You may have heard how Vince crashed his car in 1984 while boozed up, killing his passenger, Hanoi Rocks drummer Nicholas Razzle Dingley. He got off almost completely scot-free, serving about 15 days and then five years of probation. He earned himself a few more DUIs over the years, one in 2007 and another in 2010. But it's a Las Vegas altercation involving actor Nicholas Cage that's the most curious. A young female fan was attempting to ask Cage for an autograph, which Neil somehow mistook as an aggressive maneuver and yanked her by the hair, pulling her to the ground. The seemingly intoxicated Neil was then charged at by an even more in the bag Nicholas Cage, who pulled Neil away and bear hugged him, loudly stating his love for the man. Cage escorted the singer away from trouble, but Neil was still charged with misdemeanor battery. Kanye is often lauded as a musical and production genius. His larger-than-life ego fully believes this, and he acts like it when he takes the stage. 
Well, to be more accurate, whenever he feels like rolling up to the venue and eventually sauntering onto the stage, because Kanye is perpetually late for his job. Never one to shy away from taking the stage several hours late, or going on bizarre rants between songs, or even canceling shows on the fly, Wes still has fans in his corner for some reason. Honestly, we don't understand how you can support a dude who does things like, oh, we don't know, berate a person with a disability for not standing up? In 2014, Kanye was feeling very much in the moment and requested that every single person in the crowd stand up. He felt that not everyone was partaking, so he stopped the show for a bit and had the house lights turned on. The fans at the Sydney concert just weren't meeting his demands, it seemed, and he stated that he literally could not perform this song until everyone rose. One fan couldn't help it. They were in a wheelchair. West continually brought it to the crowd's attention that this person just wasn't following his orders, despite concert goers near the fan trying to point out that this person, you know, physically could not stand up. West, after way too long, finally took the hint and let the person off blast. That brush with idiocy didn't teach him any lessons, as another show in Australia a few days later saw West telling the audience that people who weren't standing needed to show him proof of disability, whatever that means. Billy Idol seems to be one of those rock stars who would likely leave his image behind when he steps off stage. Sure, he seems cool and sexy and slightly dangerous when he's crooked-lipped crooning white wedding for thousands of people, but you can imagine him quietly retiring to his hotel room for some tea after a show. At least, that's what you'd think, if it weren't for his notorious behavior during his stay in Bangkok in the early 90s. Idol cooped himself up in a series of hotels and engaged in an extended binge of debauchery that would make Satan weep. Somehow, during his wild fling, he found time during his three-week stay to do a reported $200,000 worth of damage to one penthouse suite. As is to be expected when Billy Idol is partaking in drugs and sex and ransacking rooms, the military was brought in to help matters. Idol was strapped to a stretcher by soldiers of the Thai military and forcibly dismissed from the premises. Boy George was the androgynous leader of the 80s band Culture Club. Known for his flamboyant behavior, the singer, whose real name is George O'Dowd, also privately suffered from a crippling drug addiction throughout his later career. Several incidents involved him possessing cocaine or admitting to being on heroin during his 80s success, but most of them involved him hurting only himself. That changed in 2009 when Boy George was attempting to conduct a naked photo session in his home with a male escort. Cocaine soon entered the equation, and a little later, Boy George became increasingly agitated with the man, accusing him of trying to hack into his computer. When the escort tried to protest, George handcuffed him to a wall fixture and retreated to another room, returning with all sorts of straps, adult toys, and chains. The rock star then began beating the escort with said chains. The poor man eventually broke free and fled into the streets. O'Dowd earned himself a 15-month prison sentence, but celebrity being what it is, he only served four. The band R.E.M. has made a pretty good career of making music while also sidestepping a lot of the notoriety and scandals that can plague a rock band. Really, the most behind the music-y episode of their career is when their poor drummer suffered an aneurysm on stage in the 90s. But in 2002, guitarist Peter Buck embarked on a flight and attempted to make up for all those years of boring good behavior at once. On the Seattle to London plane ride, Buck began downing wine like it was the end of the world, chugging 15 glasses and becoming increasingly belligerent to the flight staff. He was cut off, see, too little too late in the dictionary, but the shenanigans didn't stop there. He tried to grab a bottle of champagne from the galley but was denied. He punched the wall of the plane loudly and tried to pull a knife from a serving cart. He brandished a cup of yogurt and spoon like they were weapons, and splattered several people with a dairy product. Buck then tried to open the plane door, saying he was, quote, going home. At one point, he confused a serving cart with a CD player and also claimed a perfect stranger was his wife. These mile-high adventures should have made the assault charges levied against him stick, but alas, Peter Buck was found innocent. You might think being shot nine times would give you a more positive outlook on life, like in a live well and be good to people way, especially toward your own children and maybe strangers you meet during your travels. But 50 Cent, or Curtis Jackson, still harbors resentment toward many, blood relative or not, and he's not afraid to speak openly about his grudges. 50 Cent has a son named Marquise, and to say they're estranged is a bit of an understatement. The two have been at odds for over a decade, and when 50 saw an Instagram post of a 21-year-old Marquise in 2018, he publicly commented that if his son got hit by a bus, he quote, wouldn't have a bad day. 
Can you feel the love? If you were feeling left out, the rapper can also turn his ire toward the general public. He went on live video to mock a teenage airport employee, thinking he would razz on the youth of today. He even put the kid on blast in the video, even as the poor guy just tried to avoid eye contact and work his job. 50 took this behavior as being on drugs, stating that the teen's pupils were dilated as definitive proof. He hot as a mother right here in the airport. Pupils dilated, everything looking like that. The video went viral and attracted the attention of many, including the teen's parents, who pointed out that their son was not a druggie but did have autism and social anxiety. 50 eventually gave a weak apology. Maybe he'll get some dope rhymes out of the whole ordeal, but probably not. Billy Bob Thornton, while not acting on screen, also plays in a band. He really, really wants you to know that and to not ask him about his day job. His band, The Boxmasters, had a run of gigs they were promoting on a Toronto radio station when the host, Gian Gomeshi, had the misfortune of mentioning that Thornton had been in some movies in the past. Entertainment Weekly reported that Thornton bristled at his work being brought up and then gave a masterclass about being difficult on the air. Questions were evaded or flat out ignored with stunning tenacity. Uh, Billy Bob, you, you guys formed only in the last couple of years, right? I don't know what you're talking about. Gomeshi noted that the band was currently on tour with Willie Nelson. Pretty cool, right? Thornton's response? I've never met him. The air was thick with ridicule and hostility, and Thornton eventually said the host had been instructed not to bring up his acting career. The Boxmasters were supposed to play a song in the studio, but Thornton refused to join, apparently making up a lie that he didn't have his drums with him and then just bouncing from the studio altogether. Funnily enough, the Toronto shows he was promoting ended with the band being booed because of his on-air antics, according to Rolling Stone. Two subsequent shows were cancelled. As the one-hit wonder performer of a novelty song about drugs, Afro Man is known primarily for 2001's Because I Got High. Both a celebration of and a cautionary tale against smoking marijuana, it details how a man's life goes terribly wrong because he neglects to take care of a series of escalating responsibilities, choosing instead to get high. At first, Afro Man seemed like a jovial, chilled-out presence. One guess why, both on his record and in the video featuring noted fictional stoners Jay and Silent Bob. But the next time Afro Man made headlines, it was because of an ugly incident at a 2015 concert in Biloxi, Mississippi. According to TMZ, while Afro Man was performing, a female fan got up on stage and danced next to him to which he responded by flipping around and decking her in the face. According to witnesses, the woman crumbled to the ground, crying and bleeding, while Afro Man continued with his song. Before long, police had ended the concert, arrested Afro Man, and booked him on an assault charge. The fan, Haley Bird, sued the company that owns the concert venue and Afro Man himself. As reported in TMZ, especially on account of how she may have suffered a concussion from the punch, a judge ruled in her favor, ordering Afro Man to pay out $65,000. As the lead singer and chief creative force behind Smashing Pumpkins, Billy Corgan snarled his way to alternative rock superstardom in the 90s. With songs of anger and dissatisfaction like Zero and Today, millions of jaded young people found an ally in Corgan, who, over the past 20-odd years, has made a second career in starting feuds. For example, he dated Hull's Courtney Love before her marriage to Kurt Cobain and then again after his death, according to Us Magazine. Corgan also worked on Hull's Celebrity Skin, which he then publicly trashed, saying it left a bad taste in his mouth. Years later, according to Rolling Stone, he wrote songs for a Love solo album that were included against his wishes, leading him to use Twitter to dismiss her, saying she should go away and live off her husband's money. And that's just how he treats people he knows. Corgan has more vitriol for strangers. According to Queerty, in 2011, he directed verbal abuse at a trans woman, while in 2016, The Guardian noted that Corgan went on the conservative Alex Jones show and compared politically progressive social justice warriors to both 1930s KKK members and the Maoists who started a communist revolution in China. Jennifer Lopez is a major actress and a mega-successful pop singer, but she insists she's still just a normal person, belaboring the point on her hit single, Jenny from the Block. There's quite a bit of evidence, however, that Lopez doesn't care to mingle with common folk. According to Star Magazine, one of the singer's associates told them, She doesn't speak to salespeople, restaurant or hotel staff, or flight attendants. She only talks through her assistants. Also, on one occasion, a flight attendant allegedly asked Lopez if he could get her a beverage. The attendant said, 
but Jennifer refused to acknowledge me. She turned her head away and told her personal assistant, please tell him that I'd like a Diet Coke and lime. And in 2012, a maid working at a hotel in Germany told Us Weekly that she asked Lopez for her autograph during a stay. Assistants rejected her on Lopez's behalf, and a day later, the maid said she was fired after Lopez complained. Lopez apparently isn't much kinder to famous people. In a 1998 interview with Movie Line, she gave her shockingly unfiltered opinions of her actress competition. Lopez called Cameron Diaz, a lucky model who's been given a lot of opportunities I just wish she would have done more with. She also noted that Winona Ryder, quote, gets nominated for Oscars, but I've never heard anyone in the public or among my friends say, oh, I love her. Gwyneth Paltrow may have gotten the worst of it, though, as Lopez said she couldn't, quote, remember anything she was in. The Beach Boys' chief songwriter, Brian Wilson, took things to the next level in the mid-60s, creating pop symphonies like Pet Sounds, which is universally regarded as one of the greatest records ever made. Wilson's bandmate and cousin, Mike Love, however, didn't agree. According to Vice, when he heard a sample of what would become Pet Sounds, Love barked, Who's gonna hear this The ears of a dog? Ironically, that gave Wilson the idea to name it Pet Sounds. Love would also go on the offensive several times. In 1992, according to Associated Press, he successfully sued Wilson for songwriting credits on dozens of old Beach Boys tunes. In 2005, according to Today, Love sued Wilson again, claiming he, quote, shamelessly misappropriated their band by distributing a Beach Boys CD to promote Smile, his solo album that had originally been a Beach Boys project in the 60s. According to Rolling Stone, Wilson scrapped that album because Love had been so critical of it. Brian Wilson isn't the only seemingly untouchable icon to earn Mike Love's ire. On the night the Beach Boys were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1988, Love went off on the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. The Beach Boys have continued to do about, we did about 180 performances last year. I'd like to see the mop tops match that. Love then continued the challenge, saying, I'd like to see Mick Jagger get out on his stage and do I Get Around versus Jumpin' Jack Flash any day now. Tommy Lee was a founding member of Motley Crue, one of the most proudly debauched and depraved bands in rock history. It's all laid out in mind-blowing detail in the collective crew bio, The Dirt. Although Lee got into semantics on his own, such as an off-and-on relationship with Pamela Anderson that resulted in a lucrative honeymoon tape, as well as some jail time. Per the Los Angeles Times, Lee had a long rap sheet of violent charges, which a California judge noted in 1998 when he sentenced the drummer to six months in jail, plus three years probation, for spousal battery. Lee reportedly assaulted Anderson while she was holding their baby son, because she wouldn't tell her parents to cancel a visit. MTV News reported that Lee was later charged with inciting a riot at a 1997 concert after he assisted bandmate Nikki Six in pouring beer on a security guard's head. According to Court TV, Lee was sued on another occasion when a four-year-old boy drowned in his swimming pool during his son's birthday party. He was cleared of any wrongdoing there, but Lee got himself back in the news once more in 2018 when The Blast reported that he landed in the hospital after a fist fight with his adult son. What a mess. If you or someone you know is struggling with domestic abuse, please call or chat online with the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233.